Okay. Um, so this uh, so-called paper is actually an uh, excerpt from a book I'm writing called Election Forensics. And uh, the part that you've got is about the part of the book manuscript that's about a certain set of digit tests um, on especially uh, precinct data. So um, the claim originally was maybe these tests were useful for detecting fraud in elections. As I've been working on it over the years, it seems they're um, either useful for detecting other kinds of things, or the other view is they respond to almost anything. Okay. So uh, I'm looking at precinct level vote counts or polling station level vote counts, uh, not counties, not districts, but precincts. Um, so it's uh, fairly special for me to be able to get data from these levels. So I've managed to do so for many countries and many elections. And I'm looking at the second digit. Uh, and without getting to all the background, there's something called Benford's Law that describes a particularly uh, pattern in which the digits in the number ought to occur. For example, Benford's Law says that a zero should occur as a second digit about 12.5% of the time, and uh, there are other percentages. So um, two authors, uh, Parici and Torres, statisticians, have uh, claimed that they published a couple of years ago that that particular law applied to vote statistics is a sufficient measure for detecting election fraud, uh, which if it worked would be a wonderful thing, I guess. Um, and so if you test the digits in the votes and you find that they do not satisfy this pattern of that specified by inference law, then that means there's fraud, okay? So the last bullet point on this slide is I don't think that's true. Um, certainly not with precinct level vote counts, with other aggregates or other things going on, but I won't talk about them. But I think the things in the first bullet point are true, which is that the precinct vote counts respond in regular, meaning reliable ways, to normal political variations, such as district imbalance, which is the polite way of saying gerrymander. Uh, maybe if that's something you think is normatively undesirable, as Pippa was talking about, then this might be helpful to detect the effect of that. Um, others don't agree, of course, of whether it's desirable or not, uh, but that's something it responds to. Um, strategies that the voters use. Um, a standard strategy is if you vote, if you have three parties and your candidate's going to lose, you might vote for one of the other two parties who you think is not going to have a, not going to lose. And so that kind of wasted vote argument can actually be detected by these digit tests. Other kinds of things can also be detected. So the paper or the, the excerpts go on and on about many of these details. I just want to show a couple of things. So uh, I guess because I learned this is an Ameri a US election panel, it's fortuitous that I chose the US election example to put on this slide. <laughs> um, so I have a data from in the paper from the US, Canada, Germany, and Mexico. I have data from some other countries in the book. Um, so this is typical of the data that we have. Uh, and these are tests of the so-called second digit Bemper's Law um, phenomena, which is a name I actually invented, uh, 2BL. Um, and the key statistic to see is this chi-square statistic, which assesses whether the distribution of the digits followed the pattern specified by this uh, uh, probability distribution. The significance probability is in this column, alpha. And if the number here is greater than 0 0.05, then we find that um, there is not evidence against this Benford's Law thing. But if the numbers, as you can see, they're all zero, then pretty much you can reject this hypothesis that Benford's Law describes these digits. And so a simple-minded argument would be that in the 1984 election in the United States, uh, the votes for president, U.S. representative, and state house legislatures were all fraudulent. Similarly in 86 and in 98 and in 90, and uh, no, they weren't. Um, I don't think so, at least. Um, if you go forward, it's the data from the 2000s. Things get a little bit more nuanced. If we look at the same uh, column, alpha here, we see interestingly that the Democrats' patterns are uh, rejecting this hypothesis for the Memphis Law every time, and the Republicans are not. So what we see in the slide clearly is the power of ACORN. <laughs> Uh, that would be a joke, except I actually didn't show these data for a year and a half because I didn't want to su be subjected to such arguments. Uh, <laughs> that's actually not a joke. That's literally true. Okay. So anyway, the, um, I'm not going to argue differently. Uh, why there's a change between the 80s and the 2000s is a focus of an argument I make in the chapter uh, or part of the pa book, uh, paper that's about uh, these elections. Okay. So a negative story about Benford's law not being related to fraud. Fraud, of course, can't go by, well, I know those are clean elections. A long time ago, people said you should apply this test to countries with dirty elections and countries with clean elections. 
And I said, okay, so tell me the countries of clean elections. <laughs> Okay, kind of hard to do that, right? So I have a po I can't say for sure whether all these elections were clean because I have no idea, um, but I can tell you things that systematically are positively moving these the statistics around. So um, that's what I'm going to do here. So I did two kinds of things. One is a simulation exercise where I simulated data uh, in a way that I uh, won't talk about much, but you can see typical patterns uh, in the mean of the second digits as a function of my simulated thing. So I know for sure what's going on because I created the data. So the baseline here, this is a tied election with two candidates, and it's set to be Benford's Law because I created the data that way. And as you get a more lopsided district, could be more gerrymandered if you want, one candidate's advantage increases over the other. You see the mean of the digits goes up and down for the losing candidate and down for the winning one. If there's no turnout decline as a function of the lopsidedness of the district, if in a lopsided election people decide to stay home, you have so-called turnout decline, and you get these patterns typically. So this is in simulated data. So one reason for the departure from Benford's Law could be this normal political phenomenon, which is pretty much universal. And in fact, in real data, I see patterns like this. Other patterns that are, are strategic behavior <coughs> have other kinds of variations that I won't go through. So part of the project has been given this baseline of intuition, I guess. There's no formal theory that justifies any of this, but I have these simulations. I've gone looking around in elections in many countries in many years to see, well, if I understand the politics and what people have written about those elections, about voter behavior, and about the uh, officials' treatment and the party's actions and so on, and look at the digits, do they match up? And they sort of do. So I'll give two examples. One is in Mexico, um, with uh, apologies for the title of this panel. Um, and so this is a convenient example I thought would be intuitive for everybody because it involves coalitions. So a coalition is naturally two different political parties decide to run candidates together. So the voters of one party are definitely swallowing hard and voting for somebody they might not like as much versus when they can keep separate. So the coalition seems to be more strategic in a sense than the separate parties. At least I'm hoping that intuition works out. So in 2012, there was a case where the PRI and the Environmental Party, PVM, formed a partial coalition. So they ran coalition candidates in some districts, but not others. Um, and so uh, you can see that, uh, so here, so these are patterns where I plotted the conditional mean of the second digits against the margin between the first place candidate and the third place candidate and the second place candidate and the third place candidate. Respectively, this has to do with the wasted vote argument, and I can motivate that in questions if you want to hear about it. But the main point is that here's the coalition, and you can see maybe that the digits when they ran as a coalition against the MP coalition are very different than when the PRI ran separately. Um, here the digits never are less than 4.35, which is a number that turns out to be kind of magical or a real reliable pattern in these things that indicates, I think, strategic behavior whereas these digits are never different from the mean you get with Benford's Law. So this coalition implying strategic behavior really changes voters' behavior. There's another example of a table, um, and this is the, it affects not only the coalition party, but the other party. So here's the coalition where it's not present versus PAN, and PAN, when it's running against the coalition, tends to have elevated digits, whereas when it's not running against the coalition, tends not to. Okay, so this is just a little taste of the kind of thing that I go on for, oh, 100 pages uh, writing about uh, in great detail, so I won't go into more than that. So for the U.S. case, very briefly, uh, the claim that is very much a discovery, something I didn't really expect um, to end up concluding, and after Steve talks, I may decide I don't want to conclude this, um, but I think I'm pretty committed to it <coughs> as of right now. So in the 80s, there's something called... Uh, the Alicina Rosenthal mechanism, these are two political uh, scientists and economists that described a particular pattern of relationships between presidential elections and midterm elections, and it has lots of complications, but bottom line, it implies that in a presidential year, the party opposite the president ought to gain strategic votes in the legislative election. So the U.S. House in 84, where Ronald Reagan, the Republican, really whomped uh, Walter Mondale, the Democrats in that year ought to gain strategic votes according to this uh, theory, at least that's my simplified version of it. And I think the theory is pretty much uh, well established by papers by these two authors and by me actually um, uh, for the 80s. By the 2000s, it turns out not to be the case. And so I'll show you what that looks like. 
Uh, by 2010, of course, we have the Tea Party, which uh, got great excitement by some people around Harvard, actually. Um, uh, Theta Festival wrote a book about this. Um, but the question is whether the Tea Party is really something special or just another midterm uh, urge against the president. So uh, again, spending about 90 seconds on this, which is my reigning time. So in 84, here's the pattern you see. And uh, it, the main thing is here's the Republicans in places where they won. And this pattern basically looks like the pattern where there's no strategic voting and just uh, the district is lopsided. You can see it goes up and down like that. And I'll go back just a little bit so you can see the theoretical model. It looks basically like this plot right here. So the simulation matches the reality. Whereas if you look at the Democrats where they won, which is, oops, is down here in this column, you can see that the, the bar that represents the Benford's Law pattern is not here because it's always elevated around 4.35 for the Democrats. This is precisely, at least I say, what should happen if Alice and Rosenthal is true for 84, which I think it is, and you see the Democrats gaining, Republicans not. If you go to 86, the prediction is that the Democrats don't gain anything, and you can see the Democratic pattern comes down and it's no longer elevated. The Republicans remain basically the same as they did qualitatively. So that's the pattern of the 80s. Come fast forward to 2000s. In 2006, um, now it's not exactly clear whether the Democrats are elevated, but they're statistically significantly greater than, uh, than this dotted line for most of the distribution. And the Republicans are still kind of oscillating. Not surprising, Democrats won. But the Democrats really shouldn't be there. Here's the presidential election of 2008. Now the Republicans really should be elevated, according to Alicina Rosenthal, because Obama expect, was expected to win and did win pretty handily, but they're not, <coughs> um, whereas the Democrats are mostly elevated. Um, so something has changed. Um, and for 2010, you can see still the Democrats are elevated, whereas the Republicans are not. They just basically look the same, as they always do. So the 80s are different from the 2000s. Midterm elections in the, in the 2000s look like midterm elections in the 1980s. And I uh, interpret this as due to changes in the pattern of mobilization, where the Democrats basically have figured out something that they're doing differently than the Republicans. Okay. So this is just one of the cases I do. I go through great length talk about elections in Germany and in Canada and in Mexico. Um, in the uh, long uh, bit that I sent for this conference. If you're interested, you could read that um, and hopefully look at my book in the next couple of years or so, um, hopefully this year or next year. Um, but anyway, uh, my conclusion is that statistics based on the second digit of precinct vote counts are meaningful. So getting these data could be useful to interpret the election. And if you have a baseline of the kind of complications involving the kind of strategies voters are using, the kind of coalitions that exist, the kind of ways districts are drawn, and you have this over time, then you might be able to use this more complicated baseline, not Benford's Law, but more complicated baselines, maybe to evaluate fraud. Uh, I made some claims about fraud in the Iran election of 2009, where I used these methods to sort of diagnose fraud there. So, but I think it's a little more complicated to use these as fraud mechanisms. Unfortunately, the simple rule of thumb of Benford's Law or not is, I don't think, good enough. Uh, Preach and Torres don't agree with me, I know, but I don't think I don't agree with them. Um, uh, but I think that these things, regardless of whether they're fraud diagnostics, could be useful for more general political science interests. Thanks.